Uh, you said at the beginning of the talk that the Einstein general theory of relativity wouldn't have been discovered for another 100 years if he hadn't come up with it. What is it in that theory that made him the only person who could have done that? Was it, uh, was it because it was a thought experiment, something that didn't come out of the ideas circulating at the time? Was it because it was not so mathematically necessary? Uh, great question. What was special about this theory that other people weren't close? Uh, one thing he did is he, to often do something well, it helps if you create your own tools. Uh, the Cavendish Lab in Cambridge had a graduate student in the early 20th century who thought, we need a better way to detect small amounts of radioactive breakdown. His name was Hans Geiger. He came up with the Geiger counter. The moment they had that, they had a jump on anybody else. And if other people didn't have a Geiger counter, they couldn't do what the Cavendish did. Einstein and a particular friend of his, a, a man named Grossman, began to use some mathematics, which now is famous, but was very little known. It was mathematics from the mid-19th uh, century about studying uh, the intrinsic curves of surfaces. Um, if I'm an ant on a table like this, it seems flat. But we know that if the Earth was a perfect sphere or something like this, a tiny little ant on here might also think this is flat. At any point, it's locally flat. How possibly could an ant on the Earth detect that the Earth is, is curved? Here's how. Suppose two ants are best friends. This is a sort of thought experiment that Einstein did use when he was developing this, and hardly anybody else was thinking of this. Not even ants, two people. There's a way that... Um, you and I can stay parallel. We can walk together parallel, and we can each say we're going to stay parallel. We're going to head due north, but yet some ineluctable force will make us get closer and closer and closer, even more than just charm. Suppose we're walking straight towards the North Pole, right? If you meant you start at the equator, you're both walking towards the North Pole. Clearly, you converge, right? We at no point will think we're not going parallel. We'll think, you know, it's okay, but she's not paying attention. Or you're saying, oh, he's okay, but he's dawdling a little bit. He's probably looking for ping pong balls or something. <laughs> um, the, re the redemption offer uh, still holds. But by seeing that parallel lines will converge, you can tell we're on a curved surface, even if locally you can't tell. If you set out sufficiently large triangles on Earth, you could see that they bulge out. It's interesting, isn't it? So it turns out the mathematics, it's not incredibly complex, but it was new. Uh, hardly anybody was using it. So Einstein was one of the only people using it. Immediately, he was in a tiny, tiny little subset. And then, in addition, you were you're exactly right when you mentioned about the thought experiment. This thing that I was uh, uh, presenting with us being in the Starship Enterprise, when you're pushed by something, or it says why it feels like a gravitational pull, he was playing with that idea, and hardly anybody else was doing that. So imagine like a Venn diagram. This is that sort of Math. These are the sort of ideas. The overlap was almost nobody. He was one of the only people working on this. Nobody was coming close. Next question. Th thanks, David, for a fabulous talk. And to, uh, you know, to see the follow-on, I'm a devotee of E equals MC squared, and I have actually read this book, and it's absolutely marvelous. I commend it to you all. Um, uh, my question for you is actually a slightly more philosophical and maybe even romantic one, which is if you could... Uh, accelerate enough or find yourself in the position of a, a, a Star Trek episode where you could go back in time and you could meet, meet Einstein, would you prefer to meet him when he was young or when he was old? Mm -hmm. And what would you tell him or ask him? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> you should be a science writer. <laughs> Great question. I think I would uh, like to meet him when he was old. I'd like to meet him when he was old and reassure him. Not about quantum mechanics. Uh, it seems that he was actually wrong. There were some technical uh, experiments that were done in the 50s and especially the 60s, which suggest that his idea that what we're noticing is an epiphenomena, there's an underlying thing which is clear, it seems that that's not the case. But I would reassure him that the other stuff he did was stunning. And it was stunning, it was a reminder of what humans, it was this cartoon. Look at this. This is what planet Earth can do. We do a lot of other things, but we can produce an Einstein. Even more than that, we can have a safe place, where I, the good safe place at universities, where Einsteins can develop their work. He'd be remembered, and also, he'd be loved. Love was something that he really felt a little bit bad about. Affairs could be fun, but eh, 
uh, they run out of steam after a while. His best friend, when he was a, a young man at a university, was an Italian uh, engineer, Michele Besso. And they stayed good friends for 50 years. And Besso died a little bit before Einstein did. And uh, Einstein wrote to his family in Italy. And he said, you know what I admired about your father? He was a good man. He was an honest man. He was a bright man. But more than anything else, more than anything else, he made a relationship with one woman last for his entire life, something which I, sadly, have failed in twice. Isn't that something? So Einstein, he couldn't have that with all the people around him. But the idea that he had this relationship with the future, I think he would have loved that. There was another hand up over there, yes. And then one here. Thank you. That was, uh, was very, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you're, it, it, my, my question is regarding lots of Einstein's earlier history and, um, and the fact that he, that he, along with Max Planck, were sort of credited with the first developments of quantum mechanics yeah. and the idea of, 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 of electrons and photons being, you know, um, quantized. Um, and that, that Einstein and Niels Bohr, within a few years of, of one another, were trying to work on the, those aspects. Niels Bohr got it right with looking at the quantization of the electron, mm -hmm. but Einstein made the you know made the error of trying to look at it from the from the aspect of photons. And I and I'd just like to hear you sort of like talk a little bit about what effect you think that had on like sort of how Einstein felt about quantum mechanics later in his life and, yeah. and, and uh, that, uh, that's a good question because some people um there's people you can often look at your intellectual history as being path dependent if something happens here it can block you now the question is does it permanently block you or do you go around it basically it's like the sun zephing around you know the distant starlight or not um some pe times people will have a traumatic uh, episode. You get, you get a terrible experience with mathematics, you're only going to go into non-mathematical fields. Or you sulk. People in a certain area are unwelcoming to you. You stay away from that. I don't think in this case that's what happened. A and the proof of that is that when it came to uh, the ideas of general relativity, the ones I was talking to more, Einstein had, there were many times when he got it wrong. There were many times when people discouraged him. And when he went down areas for several years, his notebooks have been analyzed and written about very beautifully. Um, and he would be, again, his persistence would get around him. So he really loved Nels Bohr. One of the sad things is when they were old at Princeton and Nels Bohr was still active, Nels Bohr came to visit and was giving a seminar full of excited, uh, uh, bright graduate students. And Einstein was too embarrassed even to go up to speak to him. He said, oh yeah, I'm busy, like that. And it really hurt Bohr's feeling. Einstein's seminars, would only, the only people who had come to it were locals or visiting celebrities who wanted to say they'd been to an Einstein seminar. Working scientists had no interest. So, but when he was younger, that wouldn't have blocked him. Repeatedly, he went into one area. If he was blocked, he still had a persistent goal. He would go around it and, and keep on working. What did block him was feeling that Nels Bohr fundamentally was wrong, even though in this assessment it seems that Einstein was wrong. The break, the break of their friendship really hurt Einstein. The idea that he couldn't, he couldn't share with his friend, not in a competitive way, but that he knew that the friend thought he'd made a fundamental mistake. And Einstein could only defend himself so many times. Only so many times could he say, the universe has to be clear. The inner constructions, it's just the limits of our technology and our understanding. Brighter people will see something else. And there were only so many times when Nels Bohr could say, you're on the wrong side of history. It's a tragedy how they split apart. Um, hello. Um, this might be kind of a trivial question. But you mentioned um, when Einstein moved away from Germany, he had lots of offers from other universities, but not from Oxford. Can you please elaborate on that? <laughs> oh, uh, 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 Christ College Oxford was a little bit anti-Semitic in the 1920s. A number of the people there made fun of him. Uh, John Maynard Keynes wasn't at Christ College Oxford, but in his published memoirs, he also said, ooh, this, this sort of this, uh, this, I think he said something like, this. he didn't say this ape-like uh, Semite, but he used these terrible uh, uh, words. Uh, the editor of uh, Keynes's uh, collected works so that Keynes felt sorry about that afterwards and tried to help uh, Jewish refugees uh, later. But that was a consensus among many people. Einstein didn't fit. He was too clever. He was too different. He just, he unsettled things. Was there another question from up there? Yes, there is another question up there. I should also point out that, that college now is a lovely, friendly, and open place. <laughs> no snobbery has been seen there ever. 
Um, again, maybe a bit more of a philosophical question, but um, so lots of people have written a lot of work and done a lot of research into Einstein and his life and his theories and his science. Um, and I wonder whether we're, we live in a different world now and whether any scientists of today will be written about in the same way in 100 years. Um, because I, do, I don't personally get the feeling that anyone, there's a name at the moment where everyone in the world says, wow, that scientist is really revolutionary. Uh, good point. It's much harder to stand out. When Einstein was uh, interested in physics uh, in uh, Switzerland in the 19, around 1900, 1905, how many professors of physics were there in Switzerland? There were about four. I think in Germany there were maybe a few dozen. Now there's thousands and thousands and thousands. It's much harder to stand out. Um, there's an essay I highly recommend to everybody by Stephen Jay Gould, the uh, late biologist from Harvard, on the decline of the 400 hitter. Uh, for those uh, who haven't suffered uh, watching the Chicago Cubs in American baseball, a little uh, a quick footnote. Uh, if you hit the ball roughly, accurately, 40% of the time in baseball, you're called a 400 hitter. Hit it accurately 30% of the time or successfully, you're called a 300 hitter, etc. Um, in the early 20th century, there were a lot of baseball hitters uh, who were able to have an average at 400 or above, 40% or above. Since then, no one has. Why? Um, I won't, uh, I, no show of hands, but maybe just think about it for a moment, then I'll explain. Until the 1940s, there were a number of people who were able to do that. Since then, no one. There is a lot. So, Ah, now the interesting question, that's a suggestion. Why would the pitchers be getting better and not the batsmen? Because your pitchers are taller, they work out better, you know, more muscly and stuff, sometimes even without steroids. Um, but if you think about it, the batter should sort of match it. Why should players in one position be better than another? It turns out it ties in, I, I could elaborate this, but Gould does it really, really nicely. And it ties in with your question about what makes Einstein stand out. In the 1920s or the 1930s, the New York Yankees were a great baseball team. Uh, this hurts somebody from Chicago to say, but let it be so. They were a great baseball team, and their best defensive players would make about two mistakes a year. They were really, really good. That's games of over 100 games a year. Two mistakes in the year. That's really, that's really good. Nowadays, the best players also make about two mistakes a year. Okay? Turns out, in the 1920s, the worst teams hello, St. Louis, the players would make 50 or 60 mistakes a year. The New York team could go to St. Louis, or the Boston team could go to St. Louis, and be like Premier League rugby against you know, a university team. There was just no competition. Today, the worst teams are really very good. Their defensive players might make three mistakes a year. Think of it as a, a, a standard distribution. The standard deviation is tighter. Everybody's good. Everybody's really, really good. It's really hard to stand out. When post uh, was slow, somebody could have an idea and work on it without competition. Now, scientists are really nervous. They have a lot of caffeine, and it doesn't help. And they don't sleep much, and it doesn't help. And they delay children, and blah, 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 blah. It's really hard to stand out, because there's so many people who are very good. You see it in the World Cup. Uh, it used to be a, a generation ago, there'd be a handful of famous teams. And all the other teams had miserable coaches, mediocre coaches, and players who didn't know anything. Now, as we know, there's superb coaches around, and many players through countries that don't seem to have tradition can be really quite good. It's a big effect, and it sometimes can produce the effect of withdrawing the desire to go into these fields. Do you want to be one of 600 names on an experiment from CERN? I think you'll have different sorts of people going into it. You can't quite be Sir Francis Drake battling alone. Do we have time for one or two more questions? Yeah, yeah, of course, we do, we do. Sorry, do you mind if I go first? Or? Thank you. Um, isn't it, um, it seems to me quite normal and natural that somebody who's great um, uh, suffers from hubris. Um, you know, a lot of pop stars, great pop stars from the 60s, you know, they had a couple of hits. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they start, you know, appearing on stage, you know, in the 21st century, they can't sing anymore. They're still pumping out the old hits. All Correct. their new stuff is crap. You know, Neil Diamond, for example. And therefore, isn't Einstein's problem, actually, um, the mistake it's, he made was that he was just too great. Yeah, uh, he, he was great and it kept on working. And, but also he had, that, he had that philosophical notion. He had that, that underlying belief that this was the right direction to go. 
Uh, he did try to do something with that belief, but unfortunately at Princeton he used technical tools that were out of date. In fact, he was using uh, tensors, uh, as you were describing. He kept on using them to try to find a grand unified theory. Uh, it turns out technically you can't do that with tensors. You have to use different uh, mathematical tools. However, curiously, he did inspire people. I actually find this a little footnote, maybe we can discuss later. Look at the handful of people who succeeded in reinventing themselves, not in a trivial way with new clothes, but going into fundamentally new types of music and doing it well. There aren't many. There's, to some extent, Paul Simon, maybe not all the time, but on and off you know, for 20, 30 years. I find those people really, really interesting. Um, Johnny Cash and his very, very late stuff. Often you need a good producer who will bump you aside, get you out of that realm of comfort. Think of that card experiment. Not only is it financially hard to do something different, people want a sequel. I know I respond to that. Oh, there's a new Star Trek movie out. I'll see it, right? There could be something else. It's, it's hard to sell. But also, you're, you have to let go of the past, and it's scary to be, to be, to be isolated like that. Uh, Nels Bohr had a really, really good relationship with his wife and with his family and friends. Also in, in Denmark, they were proud of him. And I wonder if that gave him the, the safety, the comfort to say, okay, I'll still be supported even when I try something new, which I might not be very good at at first. Did we get a mic all the way up there? Good climbing. Oddly, um, my, my question is, is also interesting to about hubris as well. Could you remind us of that remark that's been going, I, I can't quite remember it. When Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin, met Einstein and vice versa, mm -hmm. what was it the two of them said to each other? Oh, uh, Can you in, remember the, yeah, uh, the, uh, the recognition issue? Yeah. In, in Chaplin's uh, autobiography, he talks about a time when Einstein was in Los Angeles early in 1931, and the excellent movie City Lights had just come out, and they were at the uh, premiere. By the way, Einstein's wife had a wonderful way of uh, deciding where her husband should go for dinner. She would accept every invitation that came to them, and there would be dozens. And then at the last minute, she would have a secretary phone all but the most important, saying, I'm so sorry, the professor is indisposed. It was really rude, very Berlin, and very effective. Mm -hmm. Einstein didn't know about this, but his wife, uh, Elsa, his second wife, took care of it. But he did manage, so he did go to that opening of, the, uh, of uh, Modern Times with Charlie Chaplin. And at least according to Chaplin's autobiography, Einstein said, with all the crowds there and all the flash photographers and all the attention, Einstein said, but what does it mean? And Chaplin looked at him and said, it means nothing. <laughs> Didn't one of them say, oh, um, somebody said that Chaplin said that every, everybody, he, he, Chaplin's supposed to said everybody recognizes me, but they don't know who I am. And, I, and Einstein said, yes, but everybody recognizes me and they haven't a clue what I'm thinking. That happens a lot. Was that, was that, yeah. I, I, I don't know if they said that, but that would, that, that would match some of the sentiment. Einstein was, was good about trying to get it across. So uh, who Chaplin was as a person, if it comes across in the movies, that's fine, but he didn't present it directly otherwise. Einstein wrote a lot of popular books. He, um, he gave lectures all the time. Uh, one time he was uh, giving a lecture in Vienna, uh, once he was world famous, and uh, uh, the press photographers were waiting for him to get off the train. They were all there by the first class compartment with their cameras ready. The professor didn't get off the train. And they looked at the far end of the station. There was this guy who'd come off third class with his violin case, his pipe, just slumping along. That was Professor Einstein. People loved it. So if I can abuse uh, of my position as the chair, I've got, I've got loads of questions, but I'll just pick one. Okay. Um, so I, you, you've talked a lot about Einstein, but what I would like to know about is about you as writing about Einstein, which I think is quite an interesting um, thing to talk about. Um, so your work clearly spans from the science and the technical science, making that accessible, but it's also a form of creative writing. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to know a little bit about the creative process of writing about Einstein, and in particular, I want to know why did you pick this uh, part about the mistake, mm -hmm. and what was the hardest part of the book mm -hmm. to write? 
The, the hardest part of the book was to integrate his personal life and the science. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, uh, science writers, they'll summarize the science the way you summarize a textbook, and they'll do it very clearly. And then their editors say, put in personal anecdotes. So they'll look up some anecdotes, and they'll put in the anecdotes, and they don't hang together. There's no story. I try as much as possible, and I usually fail, but I do try to switch perspective and view it from the, the hero's life. Mm -hmm. What does he himself feel as he's going going through life. Um, and then along the way, a little bit of personal stuff and the science will come naturally. It's really hard to do because you have to sort of hold it in your memory. Plus, it's easy to fantasize and imagine what it's like. If you watch Hollywood movies about Britain in the 1920s or about ancient Egypt, you realize you're watching a Hollywood movie set today. I mean, they just, they just transpose it over. So it's, I don't know how accurate, but I try to check it with, the, with authorities and with what I can get from the archives and stuff. But but I tried to get inside. Somebody was once asked a great uh, many uh, stories told about many great piano players. How do you play Mozart? Do you play him? Um, do you overdo the emotion, or do you stand back and be very austere? The answer, of course, is you play the notes. Mm -hmm. You don't overdo it. You don't underdo it. And for me, in writing, that's the hardest thing of all: to not throw in extra maudlin emotion, nor to be austere and cold about it, but to just tell the real story. All I can compare it to is a really good first date. On a bad first date, many of us will know it sometime, for me far in the past, you, would, uh, you tell your cute stories and they tell their cute stories, and you're not really connecting. But in a good one, you actually forget it's a date. You forget it's a date. You're just communicating. You realize, I feel at one. This is a really, really nice feeling. And when the writing works well, it's like that. Thank you. Let's stop there. <laughs>